right. Thank you, Lori. Good to see you guys today. Thank you so much for being here with us. You know, sometimes life gets messy. Our kids get messy. How many of you know that fact, right? Like, it gets messy. I, I remember the first time I pulled the car seat out of the car and turned it upside down. Any, any of you ever done this? You just pull it out and just shake it upside down, and it's amazing. Like, all the things that fall out of that thing. I mean, old French fries and, and fruit snacks and cereal, toys. Unbelievable. I remember uh, uh, also cleaning the couch cushions. Listen, if you have kids, it is not for the faint of heart to start cleaning under the couch cushions. I, one time I found a whole burrito, no lie, a whole burrito. I was like, somebody's saving this for later? Like, what's going on? I remember once we were driving along and there's a funky smell in the car. You ever get the funky smell in the car? You know, like, you're like, where's the food? Where's the food? Like something's, where's the thing? You, you start looking around and we couldn't find anything. I'm like, no, nah, man, this wasn't leftover funk from yesterday. This is like fresh funk going on right now. So we get in the car the next day, and again, it's even worse. It's getting, it's getting more intensified. So, so I end up pulling everything out of the car. I'm like determined, and I cannot find it forever. And finally, like tucked away underneath the, uh, one of the seats in this sort of hidden place is this little sippy cup that our kids use. And it had been filled with milk. <laughs> baking out in the 120-degree heat. And I remember, I, I, I'm like, there it is. This is the culprit. I wonder how long it's been sitting there. Of course, my next thought was a rookie parent thought. I was like, well, I got to wash it. <laughs> and so I broke the seal, no lie. And as soon as I broke the seal, I almost threw up. I mean, it was like the involuntary gag, you know? I'm like, and I learned then what all experienced parents know. So I'm gonna help you out, new parents. Like, it's not worth the five bucks for the sippy cup. Just throw that thing away. It is a lost cause. But life gets messy, kids get messy. And uh, you know, the truth is like, sometimes we find ourselves in a mess. Sometimes it's a mess we created. Sometimes it's a mess somebody else Created, And I want to talk to you over the next several weeks about how we kind of navigate the mess of life. And I want to suggest to you that when life gets messy and relationships get messy, family starts to get messy, maybe character choices or habits get messy, when we get to a place that we don't even really want to be, the most powerful thing we can experience to help us change and move forward and deal with the mess, in my opinion, is the love of God. The more you experience the depth of the love of God in your life, the more it will empower you to push forward when it's hard. The more it will empower you to keep walking even when you're going through a crisis. The more it will empower you to push through the mess that may be happening in your life and in your family. And I think this is what Paul gets to in the book of Ephesians in the New Testament when he says that he falls to his knees every day and this is what he prays for the Ephesian believers. Ephesians chapter 3 beginning in verse 18 when we get to the uh, red word, say it real loud here with me. He's, this is his prayer. He says, and may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his what? Love is. And then look what he says. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good. Who wouldn't want to be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God? I'm down, I don't even know what all that means, but I'm down with that, right? People are like, I'm not sure on all, but yeah, man made complete, the power, the life. That all sounds really good. You know what Paul's saying? He's saying the way you get to that is you have to understand more and more the height, the width, the depth of God's love for you in your life. And as you grow in that experience and understanding of God's love, the result is you become more complete. You have more life. You have more power of God's power flowing through your life. So we're kicking off a teaching series today called Jesus Loves for that reason. We're just going to look through the Bible at Jesus' teaching and insight to help us understand God's love more because that's the hinge point that can lead us to a more complete life filled with his power each day. And today I want to kind of kick it off by talking about how Jesus loves us in the mess and therefore he can save us from the mess. And I want to look at Luke chapter 15. 
In Luke chapter 15, the religious leaders are very bothered because Jesus keeps hanging out with messy people. You know, Eagles fans and people like this, messy people. You know what I'm saying? Eagles are playing the Cowboys later on today. Just, I, I watched the first game, the Cowboys uh, lost and our, our starting quarterback was out and I haven't watched a game since then. I'm like, I'm done, I'm done with you, you're dead to me. And you know what we've done? We've won every game since then. I can't decide if I should watch or not. Anyway, that's a side. I might mess it up, you guys. Anyway, messy people. Now, the Bible says that they were notorious sinners. Jesus was eating with them. Tax collectors who were seen as traitors, prostitutes, people. Look, Jesus was running with the messy crowd, and the religious leaders are really bothered by this. They're like, why would you do that? You can hang out with anybody. You're brilliant. You're smart. You're a healer. Like, you're an amazing teacher. Like, why, why are you hanging out with messy people? And Jesus responds to that question with three stories in Luke chapter 15. The first story is called the parable of the lost coin. It's about a woman who loses a coin and then basically tears her house apart to find the coin. And when she finds it, she rejoices because she found that which was lost, which was valuable to her. The second story is uh, um, the lost sheep. And it's about a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost. And the shepherd kind of puts the 99 at risk and goes after the one until that which is lost has been found. The third story isn't about a coin or a, she or a sheep, it's about a human being, it's about a son, not a, not a young son, but an adult son that gets lost. And the idea in all three stories Jesus is communicating is God is the father, God is the one who has lost something valuable when his people go astray. And God is the one who is willing to search, to leave the 99, to go after the one to bring them back home. So all of these stories are in response to the questions of religious leaders, the religious leaders are asking, why do you hang out with such messy people? I want to talk to you today about the third and most famous story. It's known as the parable of the prodigal son. And I actually think it should probably be called the parable or the story of the prodigal God. Because while we like to think that the story is about the son, I wanna suggest that the primary meaning of the story is about God and his heart towards people. So here's the story. Jesus says, there's a father, he has two sons. The youngest son, he comes to his father and he requests his inheritance early. Now we just read that today and we're like, okay, and we keep going. But in the culture at the time, the original listeners would have been shocked by this. I mean, this was about the worst thing you could say to your parent. It's like saying, dad, I wish you were dead. And I would like my inheritance from your future death now. And what the original listeners would have expected in the story is that the father would then slap his adult son and disown him forever. But in Jesus' story, he says that the father agrees, puts his own future at risk, liquidates half of what he has and passes it on to the younger son while he's still alive. And then, you know what the son does? He basically goes, the Bible says he goes to a far country and engages in wild living. In other words, he goes to the ancient version of Las Vegas and starts living la vida loca, right? <laughs> the whole thing, man. Lori told me last night, you pelvic thrusted on the stage. So I'm trying really, I'm just swaying, y'all. I'm just so, anyway. Anyway, he... He, he goes to Vegas, he lives crazy. And then, uh, you know, eventually crazy catches up to you, it always does. And, and he finds himself in a place where things are, get really hard and, and people are kind of jumping ship and his opportunities are blowing up. And then a famine hits the land and, and now he, he's, he's hungry. And it gets so bad that he's working a job taking care of pigs, which would have been especially shocking for a Hebrew to hear, you know, pigs. And he looks at the slop that the pigs are eating, the pods, and he thinks they look pretty good because he's so hungry. And this is what we read. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 17. Help me out when we get to the red word. It says, when he finally came to his what? Senses. When he came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. 
He's looking around and, and, and he makes a decision. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go back to my father because even there, there's more food than I have available here. He was at rock bottom. But what he found is that rock bottom can become the bedrock for your comeback. <laughs> Rock bottom is actually a great foundation to build on. You don't really want to have to get there, but if you get there, you can build from there. And if we're going to deal with the messes in our life, Jesus' story is going to give us a couple simple challenges. One of them is this, to come to your senses. To come. Do you see what it said in the story? He came to his senses. You know, my own life, I came to my senses uh, at 17 years old. And I'd gotten caught up around the age of 13 with drugs and alcohol and kind of running around with kids that were a lot older than me and trying to be a lot cooler than I was. And one thing led to another. And um, I had a, an addiction on my back for the better part of four years. And I remember when I finally kind of came to this place, I just, I just realized that I was either going to die, and I, I kind of thought I would die, Addicts will understand this statement. I, I never thought I would live to be 30 years old. I thought I would die or I would go to prison. Most of my friends I ran with at that time did end up in prison. Or I was going to go crazy. Always <laughs> a possibility. Still. Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. Or I was going to get help. And I remember the first time I got down on my knees. I kind of grown up around the church, but this was the first time that I finally was desperate enough and hurt enough that I was coming to my senses. And I was realizing I couldn't get free of all this stuff on my own. I desperately needed help. And I got down on my knees and just prayed that God would help me and move in my life. And I wish I could tell you that like the ceiling rolled back and angels sang and, you know, it was this amazing moment, but it was kind of none of that. It was just life. And yet I got up and I knew things would be different. The next morning I got in my car, I was driving to school and I took all my paraphernalia, if you know what I'm saying, threw it out the window. And I just started a new journey. That weekend, I walked into church for the very first time uh, on my own terms, I say, seeking God for myself, seeking answers. And I found myself in this little Bible study with this little group of people that encouraged me. They didn't judge me. They prayed for me that none of them came from an addiction background, but they just were there. They kind of modeled for me. Problem is, if you've ever been an addict, like, like once you start to get clean, you don't know how to interact with people in a normal way. You, you, you don't even know how you're supposed to kind of function in a normal way. And I just watched them and hung out with them and learned from them and you know, I always say that the church, God used the church community to save my life. And I often say, like, I'm not just the pastor of a church. I'm the product of the church. So, and many of you are as well. You understand that. The goodness and the grace of God met me there when I finally came to my senses. And I think that's true for all of us in our own way. Think about it. Like, like some of you, you were dating that guy and dating that girl and all the people around you were like, no, 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 your parents or whoever, you gotta, you can't do that. They're not good for you. It's not good. But you didn't hear any of that, right? Until you finally came to your senses right? The doctor told you you had to make changes in your health or, you know, things were not going to end well, right? And you're like, yeah, 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 in one ear, out the other until you finally come to your senses, right? Your parents always told you you need to be disciplined, you need to work hard, or you need to do well in school, or you need to, you're like, wah, 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 until you come to your senses. And the challenge is we have people, some of us in our lives right now that we're praying for that are doing very self-destructive things and we want to help them and we want to kind of rescue them. But the truth is all you can do for somebody is pray for them and lovingly try to influence them, but they have to come to their senses. You can't do that for them. So in the story, um, the prodigal son goes off and he finally, 
it gets bad enough he comes to his senses. And we see a little bit of a progression here. This is kind of what I think sin tends to do in our lives. To sin, the word literally means to miss the mark. And so the whole idea of sin is that you miss God's mark in your life, morally and in other ways. And when you begin to engage in sin, the Bible says he went away and engaged in in wild living, right? So it starts here, wild times. And it's fun at first. Look, don't let anybody tell you that like sin is not fun at first. Hello? The problem is there are consequences on the back end of that, right? It's like jumping off a building could be fun the first few seconds. If you don't realize you're going to fall to your death, you know, you're like, this is great. And so the Bible says the wages of sin, the payment of sin is death. And then wild living, eventually habits start to form. Things start to get its claws in you. One thing leads to another, and, and, it, and it typically leads to hard times. You go from wild times to hard times. Things get tough. Relationships start to blow up. The selfishness that starts to consume your life starts to affect everybody else in your life. People get tired of your stuff. Hello. And it gets hard. And then typically you get to lonely times. You see this in the story. There's a, there's a line in the story that says the prodigal son was hungry. And it says, but nobody gave him anything. He got to the lonely time. Eric Clapton has a line that he sings, nobody knows you when you're down and out. And so the hard times give way to lonely times. And I think part of it is that when you only live for yourself, eventually you're the only one left. And it's lonely. And it's hard. But the good news is that then leads finally to decision time. And you can decide to stay in the cycle and continue to live in this kind of sin journey, or you can make a decision. And I don't know where you're at today in your life. I don't know if you're in the wild times or the hard times or lonely times. Or, but I can tell you this. God has a way of bringing his people to decision time. A, a time where you come to your senses and you realize that you don't have to stay the way you are. That you don't have to live with maybe the guilt or live with the regret. That you're not destined for self-destruction. That you don't have to fear the future. That you don't have to literally hate what you're becoming. Look, you don't have to live based on what other people think or say. You don't have to keep on living in the mess. Jesus loves you in the mess so that he can save you from the mess. You can come to your senses. And this isn't just a pattern of people who have yet to become followers of Jesus. I think this is a pattern that can happen in our lives when we, when we backslide, when we drift away from God, when we engage again in sin. and We kind of can go through a similar process, but the same thing is true. Even if you've drifted, you can come back because your father longs for you to come back. And that's the next part we see in Jesus' story. That is this, come home to God. Come home to God. Uh, I saw this little piece on social media. I thought it was pretty funny. Um, it's just, uh, it says, does your dog bite? And it says, worse, he judges you. <laughs> I think a lot of people think that if they were to come back to God, if they've kind of sort of backslidden in their faith, if they've gotten distant from the things of God in their life, or maybe they've never really been sort of connected spiritually, that, that if they come back to God, there'll be all kinds of judgment and shame and you'll have to work it off for a long time and be really good to kind of make it back up to God. And, and this is sort of what we see in, in the story of the prodigal son. The son, he decides to go home, but he's already worked up a whole speech in his mind, you know, and he's going to say to the, to his dad, look, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He says, just let me be a servant, a hired hand to work and take care of things around the property. This is his mentality towards his father. And the father in the story represents God. And this is often our mentality to God. God, I, I'm going to come back and I know I've done terrible things. I know I went my own way. God, I'll, I'll work it off. I'll be really good. I'll go to church every week. I will bring an extra big Bible under my arm. God, I'll do all the things if I can just come home to you. Typically, when a son came home, as Jesus is telling the story, in that era, 
the community, if he took their inheritance and went away and then tries to come back, the community would meet him as he comes into the community, would break a pot at his feet. And the message was, you're not welcome here. You're cut off forever. You thought cancel culture was new? (laughs) And that would have been the expectation of the original hearers of Jesus' story. But instead, this is what we read. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 20. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he what? He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Now, there's a couple things the original hearers would have been shocked about. One is that he ran. A Middle Eastern patriarch did not run. That was seen as degrading shameful. And in Jesus' story, the father looks out, sees his son, who the community would have broken a pot at his feet and said, you're cut off forever. What are you doing back here? And he runs to him, undignifies himself, and throws his arms around him and begins to kiss him and hug him. And he's thrilled. And the message is this, when you return to God, he runs to you. When you come back to God and you expect all the guilt and all the shame and all the punishment, the message is God runs to you. That's just why, this is why I think Luke 15, of all of Jesus' teaching, may be the greatest story in the entire New Testament on who God actually is. It's really not about the son. Right? You can look at the prodigal son and you can say, well, I'm not that bad. Or you can look at him and say, well, that's nothing. But that's not the point. The point is the prodigal God who loves his kids, even the ones who go off to faraway places and lose themselves for a while. They can come back to him and he runs to see them. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 22. This is what the father says. His father said to the servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this what? Son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. By the way, that's where the song Amazing Grace gets the lyrics. No, that wasn't original to the song. He was lost, but now he's found. I love this last line. So the party began. The party began. The father's saying, you don't get to be a hired hand. You don't get to be a hired hand because you are my child. Nothing changes that. Nothing reverses that. Nothing cancels that. Listen, you may have forgotten your value, but God hasn't. You may have lost sight of a better future for you and your family, but God hasn't. You may have given up on making a difference with your life, but God hasn't. You may have declared you're unworthy of his love, but God hasn't. He doesn't just see you. He runs to you. He doesn't just forgive you. He embraces you. He doesn't just rescue you. He restores you. He doesn't just adopt you as as his child. He empowers you to do his will. And so he wants to take you and put you in his family, doing his work, sharing his blessings where you belong. That's the message of the story. The father runs to you and wants to bring you home. I saw there's a new movie on Netflix on Marilyn Monroe. I tried to watch some of it, but it's really artsy. I made it about 15 minutes. I might go back. But just watching a little bit of that reminded me of uh, Arthur Miller in his autobiography. He writes about being married to Marilyn Monroe. I think it was the third marriage. And he talks about Marilyn's slow descent into dependence on barbiturates, about her depression, about sort of this growing sense of paranoia and hostility that existed. And he says they were both filled with a lot of fear and worry, and he was afraid for her life. And he said one day after a doctor came in and gave her another shot so that she could sleep, he just watched her as she slept. And he wrote this. He said, I found myself straining to imagine 
miracles. What if she were to wake up and I were able to say, God loves you, darling. God loves you, darling. And she were able to believe it. He said, how I wished I still had my religion and she had hers. Even through the layers of pain, there was an awareness that the love of God was really the transformative thing. And if you could grab a hold of that and experience it and believe it, it could transform your life. And I believe it still can today. Jesus tells this most famous story in Luke 15. Not to simply remind us that no matter how far you're gone, you can always come home, but to remind us that this is who your heavenly father is. He's the dad who undignifies himself to run, who's watching for his son every day. And when he sees him, he sees him from a long way off and he runs to him and he welcomes him home. And there's another lost son in the story, the older brother, who's very disturbed by all of this, who says, look, I've been here all along. Where's my party, right? Where's my celebration? I've been here all along. And the father says, son, everything I have is yours. You've always been with me. But that which was lost has now come home. And we have to celebrate. And friends, if you're ever wondering what we value as a faith community, it's right there. Yes, we value all of those who are home. We value all of those who are part of our church family and we want to take care of them. But we also value those who are not yet here and those who are far from God in their lives. And we simply want to call them to come home to God, to experience his grace and his love. Jesus' story reminds us that he loves you even when you're lost. He loves you even when you're on the wrong path. He loves you even when you're running with the wrong crowd. He loves you even in the wild times, the hard times, and the lonely times. Jesus loves you when you don't even love yourself. He loves you when you hate yourself. And I believe I speak with his authority today when I simply say, come home to God. Come home to your heavenly father. Come home to the one who made you on purpose and for a purpose. Come home to the one who loves you with a love so deep and so wide that once you understand it, it can start to literally make you whole whole and complete. Come home to God. Jesus loves you in the mess so that he can save you from the mess. So I'm going to give you an opportunity today to just come home to him and return to him. I want to ask all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And for some of you, maybe you've never really crossed the line of faith in your life. Maybe you've never asked Christ to be the leader and forgiver of your life. For others of you, maybe that was months or years or decades ago, but you feel like you've slidden back. You've kind of drifted from home. I want to invite you to just come home again to God and know that he will run to you and meet you and forgive you and work in your life. Let me just lead you in a simple prayer to open your heart to God. You can say this out loud or just in your own heart. Just say, dear God, I thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus into the world. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I believe he rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Give me the gift of eternal life. Help me face the challenges that I'm up against. God, I surrender my life to you. In Christ's name. And friends, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's your prayer, if it's your commitment today, I want to ask you to just slip your hand in the air. Just make eye contact with me, just to say before God, to say to me, you're going to follow him and trust him in your life. God bless you guys. Thank you. Just slip your hand in the air. Bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, I just thank you for each person reaching out to you today. I pray you'll move and work in their life. Forgive, restore, heal, empower. We thank you for each of them. And we give you praise today in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's put our hands together for those who made spiritual decisions in their life today. 
And I'm going to ask you to remain seated for just a moment. If you made a spiritual commitment, I want to tell you congratulations. We'd love to see you in the lobby after our experience. Or if you're watching online, just go to central.family and click I've decided to follow Jesus. We'd love to get a resource to you, be either live or online. A journal we've created called How to Follow Jesus to help you in your next steps. Well, would all of you stand together with me? And as you do, let's put our hands together for Pastor Nick, who's got a few final thoughts for us. Well, thank you, Pastor Jeff, for that incredible message. And if you prayed that prayer, first of all, we want to congratulate you. That is one of the best decisions that you could have ever made. But you can go to central.family, click on that button that says, I decided to follow Jesus. And we're going to send you some resources to help you along in your journey. Also, family, we've got people standing by ready to connect with you this week. All you have to do is send a text to 702-919-4277. Now, family, before you go, I want you to hang on to Romans 8. That says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Keep showing up.